Good morning. Oh, it's not working. I'm missing my sad guy. Good morning. All right, you're going to have to be extra quiet. Okay, now I got sound. Yes, maybe, no. All right. Good morning. Welcome to Christy Free Church this bright, sunny Sunday morning. The sun is out and the sun is here. Um, so we want to welcome you to uh, our worship service today. A couple announcements. Uh, some a couple of important things. One is um, the restroom facilities on this side of the church are not working correctly, so we have shut them down. So please, if you need to use the restrooms, use uh, the ones that are available on this side of the sanctuary. Um, annual meeting, we voted uh, last Sunday to hold that on March 21st. So please, uh, if you're a member, try and reserve that date so you can make it here, and uh, we can hold the annual meeting then. The report is uh, will be out for people to uh, look over beforehand uh, next Sunday. So you have uh, next Sunday, and then the following Sunday will be the annual meeting. Uh, if you didn't notice it, uh, oh, someone's changing things, or the slides are just rotating. But there is a called MIT, uh, not to be confused with the the uh, <clears throat> small little building in. Uh, out in Boston, but uh, the Ministry Insight Tool, that's what we're talking about with MIT, and uh, it's a survey, it's the second step in the IPM process is to assess our church health. If you can't get online, we do have paper copies of the survey, but if you can get online, please do so. That's the best way for us to, to tabulate the results. Um, both will be counted, of course, and then your in your bulletin, there's an insert with a little QR code. So if you're, you're tech savvy, you know what that is. Take a photo. The online um, shortcut shows up. You tap that, and then you, fin you start the survey. Um, once you start the survey online, you've got to finish it. It takes about 10 minutes at the most. So make sure you have 10 minutes reserved before you start it online. Um, and also, in addition to that, the first part of the IPM process was connect with people. And so, coffee with the Keeleys, I heard the coffee's running out in three weeks. <laughs> so, book your time with them now. The sign-up sheets are out there in, in the sanctuary, <clears throat> not in our uh, area. And uh, please sign up and have a chance to, to get to know Pastor Randy and Kathy and vice versa better over some coffee. Um, April, you had an announcement. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to be back. Haven't been here in a little while. I haven't been delinquent, I promise. Uh, I wish I had an exciting story to say that maybe I was wintering in Florida, but it wasn't that exciting. It just had other obligations. Um, I was actually sick in the beginning of January with a bad sinus infection, and you know, when you're sick, you're supposed to stay home, so that's what I did. Then when we were closed here, I visited some other churches, and some churches in the area are not so blessed to be able to do corporate worship like we do here, so I actually get asked to sing at other churches because they will only have special music. But anyway, good to see everybody. I've missed you all. Um, the reason I'm up here this morning is to uh, just urge you to please contact your senators if you have not done so already regarding uh, the vote on the Equality Act. It is has passed in the House, unfortunately. Um, so our last stance against that is in the Senate. Um, please pray first and foremost that our senators will vote according to what he would want. to a, a couple of places where you can actually go online very easily, um, sign up, and they will actually send 
emails on your behalf urging the senators to vote against the Equality Act. If you don't know what that is, um, there's actually information on the websites explaining that. I can help you to understand that a little bit better if you'd like at the end of the service. For those of you who do not have the internet or email, um, I also, also, actually also included the addresses that maybe you could get onto their mailing lists and their phone numbers as well so that you can call them. I included the phone numbers for our senators as well so that you can call them. It'll just take a minute or two. The, e the websites that I included, extremely easy to use, takes less than a minute. Um, and again, like I said, it explains what it is and you, it just takes a minute to fill out and they will send the emails on your behalf. All right, thank you. Thank you, April. It's a good reminder, not everyone knows Romans 3 where uh, we've all fallen short of the glory of God and uh, we've all sinned and fallen short. And that's the equality that uh, God's worried about. Um, but uh, also we have a lot of people who don't acknowledge God and know who he is and practice his morals. So uh, it's important for us to follow up with our, through the government process and trying to make sure that uh, the laws that are put in place honor God. So thank you, April, for doing that. Um, what else do I have? Okay, just a reminder, Awana is this week at, at 6, and Ladies Bible Study is on Tuesdays and Fridays this week as well. And uh, to prepare our hearts for uh, worship, I've chosen uh, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Let's bow our heads before God in prayer. Lord, thank you for the reminder that uh, all power comes from you and that we need to cover ourselves with your word, with your strength, your Holy Spirit. Lord, we live, and you know, in a world that is uh, filled with sin, filled with uh, distractions from what uh, you would have us truly do as what you've created us for. Lord, we uh, come before you um, asking for forgiveness for the things that uh, we have either not done or uh, have done uh, that's not in your will. And Lord, uh, we know that through the power of your Son, through what he did on the cross, you can forgive us. And you do and have, both for our sins in the past, today, and in the future. And Lord, we ask that uh, we can... Uh, a pre fully appreciate that grace by giving back to you and worship the glory that you fully deserve. And we ask that you bless this, this, this worship service this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I was listening to the radio yesterday, and I'm going to confess it was NPR. So <laughs> for whatever that means to anybody out there, um, uh, it was um, they were ta it was a, a show in the middle of the day called um, Play on Words or something about words and di using different words. They were talking about um, about having a sort of like a peace in your soul and, 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 and the opposite of turbulence. And the the word they were used somebody had wor used the word placid, and and they referred it to a a lake being placid. And then the other guy said, well, when a when a lake is placid, that means that that the, the water is still. So maybe the, the better word for, for having peace would be to be still. And then I got thinking, and then they, they gave an email address and I thought, and I didn't get it, I was driving, so there's no, nothing I could really do to, even to remember it. Um, then I thought of the verse, be still and know that I am God. And it's like, I, I wanted to give that to them you know, it's, I went, but I, I didn't. I, I, mean, I wished I could have. But um. Right now we're going to be a little bit the opposite of still. I'm going to ask you to stand up. And this first one, we're going to hop around a little bit. Um,
So, um, just, just saying, sing with us. There's something's ringing. Something might be a little loud, I don't know. Is this mic on? Raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a
next song is, is relatively new, um, but I'll tell you what, it takes you the whole way through the gospel from Jesus' birth to his death on the cross and his resurrection. In four verses, two and a half minutes, let's sing this song.
you guys sound like a choir. You really do. So now we're going to get a chance to really sing a, a really good choir tune, um, one that doesn't require guitar. So, wonderful grace of Jesus. We're going to be celebrating communion here in a, after the message. So let's sing this song I'm talking about the grace that he bestowed on us through, through his son. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace, the matchless grace of Jesus. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea, the rolling sea. Wonderful grace, all sufficient for me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Reaching to all the lost, by it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty for the wonderful grace of Jesus. Reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace, the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, the rolling sea. Wonderful grace, all sufficient for me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, greater for than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most divine. By His transforming power, making Him God's child. Purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, the rolling sea. Wonderful grace of Jesus, for even me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. Amen. You guys, you may be seated. I'm sure our, our Lord is, is blessed through it also. And also, what a blessing it is to be here with a whole bunch of brothers and sisters worshiping together today with this, this beautiful sunshine. It's just, uh, you know, I don't know how it gets much better than this. I was thinking, uh, there are some new faces here, uh, I noticed, and don't worry, I won't have you stand up. But I was thinking, we don't know some of you, 
but we're still related. We're still brothers and sisters in the Lord. So, so how cool is that? I know we maybe ran a little bit short with bulletins, but if you have your prayer sheet, I just ask you would take that out. And uh, even throughout the week, if you would spend some time in prayer for, uh, for other brothers and sisters. Uh, one quick update, which isn't on here, is now we know Gabe Floor is dealing with cancer. Uh, they are in the process right now of waiting for the appointment where they'll be getting the chemo uh, for the liver can uh, cancer. Excuse me. And a little bit of a change. Pam Hunsicker, uh, according to her sister, is doing, is doing good. They're ready to blood pressure. Everything is okay. They're going to be taking the old port out. Is that this week? March. Okay. All right. All right. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are just so absolutely blessed that you call us sons and daughters. And Lord, we certainly don't deserve it. We are sinners. We always have been. We always will be. But we just ask your Holy Spirit to, to fill us and to move away from that direction and to move closer, closer to you. Father, we can't thank you enough that you give us the privilege to come before you in prayer with all our needs. Lord, you have, you have created the universe. You have created everything that we see everything we don't see. Lord, you are just completely all-powerful. You are the only God, and yet you care enough about us that you give us this opportunity to come to, directly to you. Father, we, uh, we can't thank you enough for that. Lord, we absolutely can't thank you enough for the love you've shown us through the sacrifice of your Son. Uh, later today, we'll be celebrating communion, Father, and we do want to take time now to, to thank you for, for loving us enough that you're willing to sacrifice your one and only Son to pay the penalty for our sins. Father, help us to understand that that's what, that's what this is, is truly all about. We need to understand that we deserve your wrath. We deserve punishment. But because Christ took that on himself, lives uh, in line with that. And Father, we are, uh, we are a people who need you all the, always, 24 hours a day. Lord, strengthen us and uh, give us your peace in times of, in times of trouble, in times of, in times of strife. And Lord, especially as we deal with uh, physical issues, we truly need to have your, your blessing, Lord. As we, as we look at this list here, we just pray over each person here, and we just ask that when the medical community is involved, that you would give them the wisdom to be able to move us in the direction of health. And Father, when medical uh, community doesn't have the ability to do it, Lord, we know that you do. So we ask that you would make your face just truly be clear to each person on this list. Uh, Lord, help us, to, help us to turn to you as we, as we deal with issues. And Lord, I pray that you would be there in a strong and, and powerful way. And Father, we just are so blessed in so many ways. Uh, Lord, as we, as we take up a collection later on, we just pray that, that you would, that we would, even we would be blessed in that, in the offering that we give. And we just ask that this church would take it and use it in the correct way to spread, spread the gospel around the world. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just wanted to take a, just a second and say, uh, Doris and Lamar Limey, you're here with us today. That's so exciting. I see Helen Fry is with us today. Larry and Amy Mike's all here with us today. So uh, I'm just excited about that. If I missed anybody, I'm sorry. excited that you're all here today. So wonderful, wonderful to see everyone. There's in your worship folder, if you were fortunate enough to get one, there's a little handout that will help you uh, go on, uh, follow along as I go. Am I on, guys? They're working on something back there. Well, my light screen, so I guess I'll go ahead. 
top five things you'll never hear from the lips of a man. Number five. Well, how about that? I'm lost. Looks like we'll have to stop and ask for directions. Number four. Here's a credit card and keys to my new car. Go crazy. Number three. What do you mean you want to play football? Figure skating's not good enough for you, son? <laughs> Number two, here's the remote. Watch whatever you want. Can I get you something to eat? <laughs> and number one, what do you want to go and get a job for? I make plenty of money. Here's a hundred. <laughs> no, probably, I don't think I've ever said any of those <laughs> myself, but... Uh, uh, sometimes we have strange ideas of what it means to be a man. In the book, We Are Still Married, Garrison Keillor uh, writes, the town ball club was Lake Wobegon Schroeder's, so named because the starting nine were all brothers, sons of E.J. Schroeder. E.J. was ticked off if a boy hit a uh, bad pitch. He'd spit and curse and rail at him. And if a son uh, hit a home run, E.J. would say, ah, oh, blind man could have hit that one. Your grandma could have put wood on that one. If a guy couldn't hit one out, out of here, would be something wrong with him. Then he'd say, Wynn practically took that one out of here. The boys could never please him. And if they did, he'd never acknowledge it. Once again, Freeport, his oldest boy, Edwin Jim Jr., turned and ran to the center field fence for a long, high fly ball. And he threw his glove up in the air and it snagged the ball and, and he caught them both. And the runner was called out. and. When the boy looked over to the stands to see if his dad was watching, his dad went from clapping to flat, you know, uh, slapping uh, mosquitoes or something. And when Jim went and stood by his dad, his dad, uh, after just standing there a while chewing, he said, oh, I saw a man do that in Superior, Wisconsin. He did it a long time ago, and he did it at night, and the ball was hit a lot harder than that. Oh. This, unfortunately, is what is often the picture of what a man is. But it doesn't have anything to do with the picture of what we see in the scriptures of what means to be a man. In our series on great men of faith, we've looked at Joseph how he trusted God even when life did not go as planned. We looked at another Joseph also known as Barnabas in the New Testament, son of encouragement. How he trusted God and his work in others and, he, and it came out in a way he encouraged other people. And last week we talked about David and his belt with Goliath and how he trusted God in seemingly insurmountable circumstances and yet he trusted God and he went fearlessly up against that uh, up against Goliath because he knew God would fight for him today we're back in the New Testament a man that not a whole lot is known about him but he risked his life in serving other people And some important lessons for us to learn there. He followed Christ humbly, serving others by sacrificially putting their interest above his own. This is so contrary to the have it your way culture in which we live. Where we expect the world to revolve around me. I 
Unfortunately, many men believe that to bully and get your own way is the definition of being manly, but both men and women struggle with the idea of serving others. The story is told about a man who went to the doctor after several weeks of ailment and the doctor looked him over really good and was not happy with what he was seeing and he left the, the, the doctor left the exam room and called the man's wife into the doctor's office to have a chat with her and he, he said, uh, your husband is suffering from a rare form of anemia. Without treatment, he'll be dead in a few weeks. But the good news is, it can be treated with proper nutrition. You'll need to get up early every morning and fix your husband a hot breakfast, pancakes, bacon, eggs, the works. And, and he'll need a home-cooked lunch every day and an old-fashioned meat and potato dinner every evening. It would be great if you could actually bake, like pies and cookies and bread, too. And by the way, his immune system is really low, so you must work really hard to make the house spotless. Do you have any questions? And the wife said, no. She said, do you want me to break the news, or do you want to? She said, I will. So she left the doctor's office and went into the exam room and opened the door, and her husband saw the look on his on her her face and sensing the seriousness of the illness he asked her is it bad isn't it she nodded tears welling up in her eyes he said what's going to happen to me with a sob the wife blurted out the doctor says you're going to die <laughs> Sometimes we just don't get that we're to put other people's interests beyond our own. Way too often we're only concerned about ourselves, but the Apostle Paul, however, paints a very different picture of what it means to follow Christ. To follow Christ, we must humbly serve others by sacrificially putting their interests before our own. In Philippians chapter 2, we read these words. Therefore, in verse 1, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion that make my joy complete, by being like-minded, having the same love, and being one in spirit, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Th this unity and selflessness that Paul is referring to is talking about is a result of us putting the interests of others beyond in front of our own. There are four ifs that could be properly translated since because they speak of certainties. Now not every if in the Bible can be translated since but these four can and we know that from the Greek construction in the original language. But these four ifs then could be said be, because we have encouragement from being united in Christ, because we have comfort from his love, because we have fellowship with the Spirit, and because we have tenderness and compassion, then we can be like-minded. We can have the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, and we can live selflessly. By humbly serving one another and putting their interest above our own. Paul gives four examples. Four examples of what it means to do nothing out of selfish ambition. Out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility consider others more important or better than yourselves. Each of you should not look to your own interests but also to the interests of others. And the very first example is that of Jesus. In verse 5, 
we read, in your relationships with one another, have the same mind, the same mind as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage or something to grasp and hold on to. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Christ is a supreme example of what it means to be other-centered. He left the glories of heaven and came to earth for us and died for our sin because he had none of his own. Being in very nature God translates a, a, a Greek term for the word f form. Being in the form of God, being in the very nature of God. Now there's, I, I don't like to talk about Greek terms very often, but there are two Greek terms that are used in the New Testament, and both of them are used in this paragraph. This one here is the word morphe. And it means the essential form which never alters. Now that's important. Because when it's saying that Christ was in the very form of God. That's his essential nature, being God, being divine. And that never changes. Jesus did not stop being God when he came to earth. It's the outward display of an inner reality. Christ it truly is God. The other Greek term, schema, refers to the outward form which changes from time to time. And from circumstance to circumstance. So for instance, William Barclay says, Morphe of any human being is humanity. We're human. And this never changes. But a person's schema is continually changing. You're born a human, but a baby. You become a young person, or then a man or woman of middle aged. And then, yeah, an old fogey like me. But we still have, though my schema has changed and it's changing daily, some days it's harder to get out of bed than others. But the morphe continues, I am still human. Yes, believe that. I'm still human. <laughs> Jesus was of the very nature God. That never changed. But he became, took on the appearance of a man. That word appearance is the word schema. And that changed. He was born a baby. He became a man. And he died on the cross. Although Christ is fully God, he did not hesitate to set aside his self-willed use of deity when he became a man. He laid aside all of his rights of the divine and surrendered his right to manifest himself visibly as, as God. Though he still was God, he took on the appearance of a man. And he humbled himself. The very nature of a servant. That's the word morphe again. Christ in his very nature was a servant. You know, we don't often think of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as being a servant. But that's part of its very nature, Jesus. He came to serve you. And ultimately, to pay for your sin. Christ is the example. He made himself nothing. He took the very nature of a servant. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself 
and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wonderful grace of Jesus! Yes! He died for you. He died for me. God in the flesh became obedient to death, even death on the cross. He's a supreme example of humbly serving others by sacrificially putting their interest before his own. The second example is that of the Apostle Paul in this passage. In verses 12 to 18, he refers to being in chains for his preaching. This is one of the prison epistles. And in verse 17, oops, got a little trigger happy here. In verse 17, he says, But even if I am poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you. Paul is an example of humbly serving others by sacrificially putting their interests before their own. He refers to a drink offering. The, the Jewish, in the Jewish sacrificial system, it involved wine being poured out on the altar as a sacrifice for God. But Philippi, the Philippian church, had little Jewish background, so Paul might have been referring to the pagan practice of pouring out wine to their deities. But either way, it was, it was the, the sacrificing of the wine in honor to, to God. And Paul says, my life is being poured out as a drink offering for the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the gospel, my life is being poured out. He was an example of sacrificially putting the interest of others above his own. Thirdly, Timothy is an example. Paul says in verse 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Timothy genuinely cared about the Philippian believers. He was with Paul on the missionary journey, the second missionary journey when the church at Philippi was planted. And the phrase have no one else like him literally means no one of equal soul. These words of praise reveal that Timothy had a Christ-like attitude of humbly serving others by putting their interests before their own. And then fourthly, we get to the man we want to talk about this morning, Epaphroditus. Verses 25 to 30, Paul writes, But I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also a messenger, your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs, for he longs for all of you and is just distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God, having mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow, therefore... I am all the more eager to send him, so that you, when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Now, we don't know a great deal about Epaphroditus. Just six verses here in chapter 2 and one verse in chapter 4, verse 18, that mentions that he brought a financial gift 800 miles from Philippi to where Paul was in Rome to help meet Paul's need. And in that process, he became deathly ill for an extended period of time. Long enough for news to, to go from Rome back to Philippi and uh, to be told to the church of Philippi and they to express their concern for, t 
for Epaphroditus and it comes and the news comes back to to Paul and Epaphroditus in the Roman prison that yeah the church is all upset about you being sick verse 27 says he was ill and almost died death was at his doorstep literally death was coming near but God had mercy on him Paul says and on me sparing me from added sorrow verses 29 and 30 because he almost died for the work of Christ he risked his life in serving Paul through the rigors of serving Paul he almost died the word risk was actually a gambling term to recklessly lay a bet, to gamble, to expose oneself to danger. It's used who, of those who expose themselves to danger by being an advocate for another. In a post-apostolic church, it was used of, of the men and women who risked their lives by nursing uh, people back to health during the plague. Epaphroditus gambled with his life so that he might meet the imprisoned apostles' needs. Paul's not condoning the failure of taking care of oneself. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives in us. This is also not being reckless for the sake of some thrill or self-indulgence. This is placing your life in jeopardy by putting the needs of somebody else before your own. It's like running into a burning building to save somebody. It's like pushing someone out of the way of a, of a, of a zooming car. It's a soldier, a police officer, a fireman, the medical personnel. This is self, selfless service, not self-serving indulgence. It's like missionary martyr Jim Elliot said, he is no fool to give what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. If Epaphroditus sacrificed himself for the sake of the gospel in serving the Apostle Paul, he is an example of humbly serving others by sacrificially putting their interests before their own. Several life lessons. Epaphroditus was a Christ-like servant. We see several qualities needed for putting others before ourselves. The first one is we need cooperation in place of competition. Paul refers to him as my brother, my co-worker, my fellow servant. This is a sequence. It is a crescendo. He's first a fellow Christian, then a fellow Christian working together with me, with Paul for the gospel, and then a fellow Christian fighting and struggling hard for the sake of the gospel, contending together for the gospel. Your messenger was sent to take care of my needs. The Philippian church was kingdom focused. They cared about Rome and meeting, sharing the gospel with Rome. Cooperation in place of competition. After we moved into a community to pastor a church, my wife met another pastor's wife at a community function. And the other pastor's wife said to my wife, oh, it's nice to meet the competition. I'm not sure if she was joking or not. But you know, other churches are not our competition. Well, we need to cooperate together for the sake of the gospel, to build the kingdom of God, to accomplish the mission God has given to us of making disciples of Jesus Christ. So cooperation in place of competition. Number two, compassion in place of indifference. For Epaphroditus longs for all of you and is d distressed because you heard he was ill. He wasn't having a pity part of, party for himself. Rather, he's on his deathbed and he's worried about the Philippian church concerned for him being sick. Compassion in place of indifference. Number three, commitment in place of comfort. He traveled 800 miles, spent every last ounce of energy in serving Paul, and on his deathbed he was more concerned with those worrying about him than himself. And then finally, courage in, the face of, in place of safety. He risked his life for the gospel. Is your commitment to Christ deep enough to risk anything? 
Are you willing to set aside your preferences so that others might come to know Jesus? Or does the world revolve around you? And wanting things done the way you've been accustomed to. Wanting things done the way you're used to them. Wanting things done the way you like them. Or do we have the mindset of Jesus who left behind everything he knew, the glories of heaven, and came to earth to give his life for us? Let that mind be in you. Are you willing? Let me ask it this way. What are you willing to sacrifice for the gospel? Your time, your energy, your preferences, your likes, your dislikes. Pastor Rick Warren, some 30 years ago, he said, I think a lot of churches today are filled with what I call wimp religion. Christianity with no teeth, no challenge, no sacrifice, no dedication. He says, I think one of the men who demonstrates courage in my own life is my father. Courage to serve without comfort and security. I didn't know that his dad had been a pastor of a, a small churches throughout his life. But 30 years ago, he said, my dad... My dad's 71 years old and he's retired. While other men his age are at the point in life they're thinking about how to improve their golf score, he travels around the world building church buildings and paying his own expense to do it. This photo shows Rick at age four <laughs> helping his dad build a church building. He says... He had been down to the jungles of Brazil and Guatemala, up in Alaska near the Arctic Circle. He's been in the inner city of Los Angeles and out in the countryside on the plains of Idaho and also in Australia, all at his own expense. In his lifetime, he had built 150 church buildings paying his own way. He's put service before security. Doesn't sit around watching the old boob do. He says, I, while I'm here, Evidently, God has a plan. I'm going to make my life count the way that I'm gifted. And he's gifted with his hands. So he does. He humbly serves Christ by sacrificially putting the interest of others before his own. After he learned he was dying of cancer, he came to Rick and he said, Son, I think I have one more church building in me. It's, Rick said, Great, Dad. If you want to die with your boots on, go right ahead. Where's the last church you want to build? He said, Siberia. Rick treasures the photo, of the last photo of his dad. Shows him in his 80s with cancer on his knees in a roof, on a roof of a small Siberian church, hammer in hand, nailing down roof shingles during a heavy winter snowstorm. He said, that's my dad. He believed the church is the hope of the world. And he sacrificed humbly serving others putting their interest before his own. Second Chronicles chapter 16 verse 9 says, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You've done a heart checkup? Is it fully committed? Like Rick's dad, or Epaphroditus, or Timothy, or Paul, or Jesus? Is there a cooperation in place of competition, compassion, in place of indifference, commitment in place of comfort, courage in the place of safety? To follow Christ, we must humbly serve others by sacrificially putting their interest before our own. And Paul says, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like
end. I think of another passage. 2 Corinthians 5 reads, For Christ's love compels us. When we look at what Jesus did, his love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Let's meditate on the one who gave himself for us. Let's think together of the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. As you take the communion elements, would you pause and silently give thanks to the Lord? For what he's done for you in giving himself for you. Would you quietly in your heart give thanks to the Lord? Father, the fact that Christ left the glories of heaven and came to earth to give his life for us is the greatest example of love we could ever know. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Father, we thank you that he willingly went to the cross because he humbled himself and became obedient to death. Father, we are grateful that you have highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that he is Lord. And so, Father, we thank you and we declare Jesus to be Lord. As we remember his body beaten and bruised and crucified for us. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, while they were, he, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Would you pause once again to offer your own words of gratitude and thanksgiving to Christ for his blood shed for us? Father, Thank you for the cleansing that comes from the blood of Jesus Christ. 
It does far more than the blood of bulls and goats, and we give you thanks for that. We thank you for Jesus, who through his blood we have forgiveness of sin. Then Jesus took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's drink, remembering Christ. Father, words fail to describe our gratitude and the greatness of our love. Father, may our lives declare your wonderful grace in every way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close the service, as a song for us to leave by, let's stand and sing Jesus Messiah. Wrong key. See, I wanted to do it in D. <laughs>